Hi, I'm Alex L., and I write books for a living. The Hey Girl podcast was created with sisterhood and storytelling in mind. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. (laughs) I'll be sitting down with some phenomenal women to discuss love. I believe we grew distant out of love of some type. Like, I don't want to hurt you. Loss. Really don't know what's going to trigger that feeling of grief in any moment. And a topic very important to my work, self-care. I'm holding on to this self-care with every ounce of me. (laughs) Join us as we journey through sharing together. So as you guys know, I am about to have this baby and we didn't want to leave you guys high and dry while I'm on maternity leave. So what we're going to be doing is circling back to some of your favorite episodes. The first one we're starting with is Ro. Do you remember Ro? She talked about minimalism. She talked about self-care being freedom. All this good, good stuff that you guys loved and still love. So for those of you new to Hey Girl, this would be a great place to start. Ro on minimalism. Hey girl. Hey girl. How are you, Ro? It's so good to have you on the show. I'm so good. I'm so excited to be here. I can't <laughs> believe that like the moment has finally arrived. We're having a conversation. We've been planning this for a while. We have been planning this for a while, and it worked out <laughs> because of divine timing. So snap, snap for that. Um, how is how is everything in um, San Francisco? How are you and E doing? So crazy. There's so much going on. We've got a lot coming up for us in the summertime. I'm making a job transition, so I'm doing lots of planning. And then also in terms of weather, we've had five years of drought. So I think the country's joke about California was that we couldn't get our water under control. And now we just have more water than we could know what to do with. It just rains every day, every day, (laughs) every day. So it's like really moist and really busy. And but we're, we're good overall. Good. I'm really, I'm really happy to hear that. I can't wait to come back and visit. Yay! So the reason why I wanted to have you on the show is because, because I am so inspired by your journey to minimalism. And it is rare that people of color um, are seen in that space. So I would love to chat with you a little bit to talk about how you got there, why you decided minimalism, and how um, your way of life is set to inspire others. I was journaling about this today, but a little background about it is that the way that I was raised was around consumption. (laughs) It was around buying. And my mom in particular taught me all my lessons about shopping. And so for some women, they hate shopping. (laughs) And for me, it's a joy and it's a thrill (laughs) because it was a joy and it was a thrill for my mom. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, she'll say like, shopping is my drug. And for me, it was too. So they say, they talk about like your first money memory Mm -hmm. is how you build all of your beliefs and your habits around money in your life. And they want you to think back to your earliest money memory. And my earliest money memory was when my mom took me to Black Friday when I was maybe 12 or something, because we had always gone to Black Friday ever since I was like an infant. She would take me, wrap me up. We would go shopping. And we were running into JCPenney and there was just people all around us trying to grab things and lift (laughs) things, just just mayhem. And it was in the middle of this where I was at this rack and I had a, a shirt in front of me and I was looking at it. And my mom was like, what is it? Like, I think it's super cute. You should buy it. And mm. I was like, well, I don't know if I should buy it because we're here for first, like we're here to buy Christmas gifts. Mm-hmm. Like that's the purpose of Black Friday. And she looked at me with a confused look and she goes, Ro, you don't know how this works. You buy one for them, one for you, one for them, one for you. And how that moved into my like beliefs about money was that I believed whenever I did something responsible or that I just um, interpret as responsible, I deserve something for myself. Other lessons that she would teach me is that you should buy things and never really have a place to go for them. You buy first and then you decide later. So Mm. my evolution as a person was I just bought all the time. I went shopping all the time. Whenever I got a check, whenever I felt sad, whenever I wanted to celebrate, whenever I didn't have anything to do, whenever I just wanted to feel good about myself, I I would shop shop and shop and shop and shop and shop and shop and shop. 
And I didn't know that I was wreaking emotional havoc on myself, Mm -hmm. trying to feed something that couldn't be fed. Mm. And the other thing, I was wreaking financial uh, harm and violence on myself because I could never get my money right. I was always overdrafting. I was always overspending as soon as I got it. And so I never had any stability or resilience to support myself because the first thing I ever wanted to do was I wanted to shop. And there was a turning point in my life. Uh, It was actually in college, which it was actually like the highest point of my buying. Um, And my, I would uh, evaluate as my shopping addiction, Uh, (laughs) you know, because in college I was like making myself and like asserting my personality because I was at a school I'd never been in. So I could do that. Yeah. And my junior year of college, I took environmental science and the class was really short and the teacher was bizarre, but the book was incredible. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And I started learning about the environment in a new way. And the second thing that sort of shifted for me was I did international development in East Africa and I got to see where all of our thrift clothes go. Ooh. Wow. And every prom dress that you ever had, every shoe you ever bought, every t-shirt you ever picked up and you threw away and you took to Goodwill is in East Africa. Uh, for aisles and aisles and aisles and aisles of it. And it was so shocking to me that I could barely wrap my hi- mind around it, where I learned that, oh, there is no such place as a way. Mm. And then the third thing that changed my trajectory was as I was learning these other things, I came across this blog challenge <laughs> called like 10 Things for 91 Days. And I was on my sustainability journey and I was like exploring that way, but I got ma- I got pissed at this <laughs> blog post. I was like, there is no way anyone can wear 10 things for 91 days, but I'm a really competitive person. So I couldn't stop thinking about the blog post. And I was like, well, why can't you do that? No, you can't do that. Yes, you can do that. And I decided like the night before the challenge started, okay, fine, I can do this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to do it. <laughs> these people who made this blog post that I could do this. Yeah. And so I spent all this time picking at these 10 pieces and I wore them for a cold summer in San Francisco. And girl, I'm telling you, I never got as many compliments on my clothes in my entire history of dressing than I did in these three months. You told me that story when we were yeah. in California for the A Note to Self retreat. You and I slipped away and started chatting. And when you told me that, I was like, there is no way. There's but no way. you really were the first person to spark my interest in this minimal living. Having that conversation with you really blew my mind. And I like when, we, when I went home, I dove into minimalism because of you. <laughs> and I love, that. I love you for that because <laughs> it has really started to shift and shape my life, my living situation, the clutter, decluttering and all of that good stuff. But before we go there, I do want to take a step back. You mentioned you used to overdraft. Do mm-hmm. you remember the first time you oh. overdrafted and where you were? Like, do you remember that entire situation? Oh, my gosh. I feel like. I feel like it was in high school, I think was maybe the first time because that, yeah, that it must have been because I had gotten a bank account that my mom set up for me right before I went to school. Mm -hmm. So I had a a Wells Fargo bank account, I think. And I had worked this little Hallmark job where I got paid California minimum wage at the time. And I think I was... I think I was at a forever 21 or something. And I just kept on like handing my debit card to the girl. And she was like, this is not going through. (laughs) Oh my God. Um, Do you remember what you were buying? I don't remember. I don't remember the thing, but I remember signing in because also like online banking was beginning to be a thing. (laughs) And I remember signing in and just seeing multiple negative 35s that had compiled because oh it was before gosh. all of the banks decided that they wouldn't do compound overdrafts. And I was just overdraft like $115 over a piece of uh, probably a shirt or something. Wow. It was intense. Have you, okay, so I don't know if you can remember this far back, but did you call your mom? Do you remember having conversations with her about money management and money responsibility ever or has it always been buy 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 charge 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 
it's always been buy, 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 charge, 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 but we have like this back and forth relationship with it. I don't remember calling her. I don't know what I did. I, I'm not sure how I remedied the situation. I think I might have called my mom. I was like, Mom, I overdraft. And she goes, actually, you can call the bank because <laughs> she had been in this experience before because wow. she had had this pattern. So we got the bank to like forgive all of those overdrafts. But I didn't learn my lesson. Like it wasn't traumatic enough where right. that was the last time I ever overdraft. I have like a history of overdrafts. But what I remember seeing of my mom is we'd always go to Macy's or we'd always go to JCPenney or always go to like some department store and she would hand over her credit card to them that mm. she had gotten specifically from that department store so she could get the 20% off discount or whatever they give you. Right, but right. as she was handing it over, she would look over to me and she'd be like, don't ever get credit cards. So I was having this contrary message to yeah. the, my entire life of this like ambivalent relationship between extremes of like spend, don't spend, spend, don't spend, don't do that. Don't, you know, Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just couldn't get it together. It's so funny. I, I had a similar upbringing, but my mom, she did teach me about financial freedom, specifically as a black woman, how we need to have, you know, money in the bank for a rainy day and blah, blah, blah. But she was also a big spender. I was I was the only child, so I always came home to things. You know, when she would go out shopping, I always came home to things, new outfits, new this, new that. My grandfather used to, you know, just give me a hundred dollars. Here, you know, go buy something. I always had totally. I always had money and I always had things. And my mom she loved to, she still loves to shop, but she can because she's financially free. Mm. I couldn't because I wasn't financially <laughs> free, but I was shopping anyway. So I, I can kind of relate to your, your, your story about having this conflict of like buying and not buying credit or debit or whatever the case may be. So my mom used to say the same thing to me. She used to say, don't ever get a credit card unless you need it. And when you get it, make sure you pay it off every off. month yeah. and I didn't get a credit card until I was 25 mm -hmm. I went I had a lot of money saved in the bank so then I was like oh I can just use my I can use money from my savings to put on you know to pay off my card which yeah. was the stupidest <laughs> thing ever but I, I, I remember you posting about you paying off your credit card debt Mm -hmm. And how freeing that was. Can you talk to me about that? Can you tell me how how you got to that point and what made you finally be like, enough is enough. I don't want to be in debt. I want to be financially free. This is what I have to do to get there. So I totally relate to you in terms of getting things because I had that way, same way too. And I think what was it? how I got to paying off my car. Oh, it was last year. Yeah, I remember. Last year was an incredible <laughs> year for me. It was terrible for the world, but it was great. For, and it was just great, great, great for me. Mm -hmm. And I woke up one day in February and I was making my goals for the year. And I had this different kind of initiative behind me because I had just, I'm, I was also like in my Saturn return girl. I don't know what you feel about astrology, yeah, but I was, no, I, just, you. <laughs> I was like at, at 28, 29. And I, I had gone through a really tough year the year before. And yeah. I was just sick and tired of my habits. I yeah. was sick and tired of them. And I was looking at 30 and I was saying, if, when I go into 30, I no, no longer want to walk into my 30s with these habits. I am done. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at my life and I sort of sketched out and I was journaling and I had just written down uh, peripherally like, oh, pay off my credit card debt. <laughs> and my credit card debt at the time was a, around like $11,000. I'm like, oh, oh my yeah, gosh. I'm going I'm to pay that off. And that's um, a lot. I, I, it was a lot. And I really wanted to commit to other things, but I just, I wrote that. And then all of a sudden I said, okay, well, I might have to prepare myself to pay off this debt. Like, we'll see how long it's going to take, maybe two years or so. And I, I, I get obsessive about research. So <laughs> I just started finding different blogs and was reading. And I came across these two blogs in particular that really informed me. One was Mr. Money Mustache and another one was like, 
this young, young woman called Lydia Lois, and by the name of Lydia Lois, who had paid for her wedding in cash and was like, look, mm -hmm. I want to figure out how to do this. And I was really informed by the way that they were thinking about their money, which was like, it's not about making more money, but it's making different choices with the money that you have. Yeah. What if you could live abundantly on half of your income? Mm. And we, and like E and I, we do not make a lot of money. Even though we live in California, we don't make anything. Mm -hmm. But I kept on thinking about that. And it was similar to the 10 things for 91 days challenge to be like, this seems impossible, but who says that I can't do this? Mm. And so I decided to look at our money that way. I sat down with E and I was like, look, I want to pay off my credit card debt and I want to get serious about this because credit card debt is not normal. Yeah. It's a four alarm fire. Someone else owns you. Yeah. And I was done with being owned. Yeah. And so we started that. I looked at my money and I was like, okay, what would it look like to live on half of the little money that I make? <laughs> And what decisions can I make? And I wanted to live on half of it so I could use the other half to pay off my debt. And so what I was thinking was impossible. Like at the time, I was just paying $150 each month and thinking that was good enough. The first month, I think it was in June, I decided to get serious about this, that mm -hmm. I wanted to be free and like economically minimal. Mm -hmm. I sold tickets that I'd bought myself because I was like, oh, I, I can self-care, like concerts and all of these things. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> no, freedom is self-care. Yes. So I sold I love that. Tickets. Please say so, that again. Freedom is self-care. Yes. I love freedom that. Freedom is self-care. It's not about pedicures. It's not about clothing. It's not about trips. Yep. Freedom is self-care. Mm -hmm. So I sold things and I saved as much money as I possibly could, especially now that I cut back all of my expenses and I thought differently about my money. And I paid $850 on my credit card bill in June. Wow. And so I blew my own mind about what was possible when I was like, oh, I can only afford to pay $150. No, I can pay more than that if I make different decisions about the money that I have. Yes. And I continued to do that consistently in a way that I never had before. I got super creative. I found money because many of us have money where we don't even know it. Like people have money for us or a job has a 401k that you don't work at anymore. And I, I, I found money <laughs> and I paid it. I paid it. As much as I possibly could and something that I thought would take me at least two years to do I did in less than nine months that is phenomenal did you feel elated like was it unreal to you or I don't know I don't know how to explain it like that eleven thousand dollars is a lot of money it's a lot of money for you to pay off in less than a year is fantastical <laughs> like it's a lot like it doesn't even seem possible and it's it's totally like if I can do it I know we hear people say this all the time if I can do it like no y'all if I can do it you can do it and I just looked at that like zero on my credit card statement online and I had to take a minute I think I might have looked at my computer for about 15 minutes and then I wrote the post after to be like I just want to let you know <laughs> I did. I, I did. It's done. It's done. It's done. I've learned a lot. So there's also different kind of minimalists and different kinds of minimalism. And when people ask me, like, what's the first thing you should do? And, you know, what does this look like? I think they're thinking about typically the way that we see minimalism in this space, which is yeah. typically really white. And it's people who are like, oh, I've had so much money and it doesn't make me happy. It's like, yeah. yo, I don't have any money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do we do that when we don't have any money? How do we do yeah. that? How do we move through minimalism that way? Yeah, like, I don't have it. So for me, Minimalism is not about like a set number of things and that, that we have. For me, minimalism is my way to financial freedom. So how do we continue to live abundantly on far less than we think that we need? And the, I, think, I think we keep our goals in mind, which is for E and I, it's super important for us to own our own land. Like we, as, especially as people of color, have been historically uh, kept and marginalized, if, if not robbed in many ways from home ownership. Mm -hmm. and and so we want to own our own home. We want to own our own land and we want to pass that on to our children and whoever will come next. That's really, really important to us. And the way that we can do it in our mind, the best, most effective way we can do it is through minimalism. So for me, minimalism is the really the best way I know how to take care of myself, to steward my peace of mind and 
to belong to myself. Like there, there is nothing, no substitute for the feeling of liberty. Mm. And the way that I have liberty in my life is that I think differently about things. I think differently about stuff. And I use the resources, the financial resources that do come to me to support an abundant and thriving future for the next generation. That's what we're about. And I think maybe that's what the shade of this minimalism can look like mm-hmm. in communities of color. Mm-hmm. Where it's not about giving up and it's not like bougie. <laughs> it's, right. like, it's, it's really connected and deep. And, th- and that's our deep why. And when we do it, we're like, yo, y'all can, <laughs> y'all, y'all can, y'all can do this y'all can do this and we want it to be as accessible as possible because minimalism shouldn't be for the elite I suppose yeah yeah no and I'm happy that you said that because a lot of people feel as though it's unattainable I mean specifically for instance when you share after your farmer's market trips and the abundance of fruits and veggies that you have and how you store them and keep them and and going waste free, no plastic bags, things of that nature. A lot of people look at that. I have looked at that and been like, oh, I want that so bad, but how? Right. And I think that that's what people are looking for, specifically people of color. How do we get there and how do we how does it become accessible for us and our lifestyles? I'm going to give you a, a, a good example. So. We live in a 1,200 square foot apartment, two bed, two bath. And for the past year, I have been saying, we need bigger space. We need more space. We need more space. We need more space. And no, the truth is that we needed less crap. And that's really, I started diving into minimalism, tiptoeing into minimalism, (laughs) not diving into, (laughs) tiptoeing into it last year. But this year, I really dove into it. I gave away and donated to homeless shelters, boxes and boxes of work clothes for women and just, just things that we didn't need, that our family didn't need, but other families could benefit from. And our space started to open up. I walked in the house the other day after doing a deep clean and just getting, we have like a bill, bajillion books. And one day I really want us to have a library, but for now we don't need 50,000 books. <laughs> so I stored a lot of the books in boxes, maybe half in boxes. And then the rest are being donated to a school because yeah. we don't need it. And then I walk into our space. I cleaned under my desk. You know, we had just had, you know, the cleaning people come, which that's something that I invest in for our family. And I love, so our house was clean and beautiful and open. And I didn't feel like we need a bigger place. I felt like we need to do what we can with what we have. And we need mm-hmm. to minimize minimize not minimize <laughs> minimize um minimize. Just made a word. listen that's, that's a new word right uh, yeah yeah but we need to reduce exactly. the things because i'm used to having things like yeah. if i want something i i can go get it and i i equated that with financial freedom like i have the money to do it so i can do it right and that is not healthy i had to snap out of that because i was literally just swiping, swiping. Oh, th- those shoes are $300. I have that. You yeah. know, I can do that. And that's just irresponsible. It's irresponsible due to the life I say I want to have, mm-hmm. i.e. Mm-hmm. home ownership, i.e. owning land, i.e. buying our first little mini tiny home yeah. and not having to take out a loan for it. So it's really irresponsible of me to do that. And I had to check myself. And yeah. often when I'm checking myself, like you, I'm going on blogs, I'm watching the minimalist documentary, which I can halfway relate to. <laughs> and I'm reading books. And I'm going to your I'm going to Brown Kids, your Instagram, <laughs> you and E's Instagram page. And I'm getting these gentle reminders that it's within your reach and you don't need more. And being I just need to be satisfied with what I have. And, and like you said, do what you can with what you have. Hungry Root is dedicated to helping people feel great about making it easy to eat healthily on an everyday basis. They deliver weekly boxes of healthy, convenient foods that customers can use to make a variety of inspiring, delicious dishes. All of their foods are, get this, plant-based and gluten-free, and they come either ready to eat or ready in less than 15 minutes. 
that is right up my alley. Another cool thing about Hungry Root is that customers can choose to make the dishes according to their recipes or they can mix and match ingredients for additional flexibility. Magical, wonderful, easy, and seamless. Hungry Root offers fresh cut vegetables, versatile sauces, and ready to eat breakfasts and snacks. They offer over 75 dishes that we can make at home, guys. It's amazing. Their fan favorite sweet potato pad thai is made with sweet potato noodles, my favorite, spicy peanut sauce, another favorite, and snap peas. Delicious. Each box includes everything you'll need to make that week's dishes. It can range from breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Hungry Root's mission is about more than food. Hungry Root was created to positively impact people's everyday lives through delicious and nutritious eating. For $25 off each of your first two deliveries, a total savings of $50, visit HungryRoot.com and enter promo code HEYGIRL at checkout. That's www.HungryRoot.com and enter promo code HEYGIRL for $25 off each of your first two deliveries. Typically, we just have tons of space. I mean, we we just have tons of space. Yeah. And I think that we've, lo- we've especially as of people of color with so much being taken away from us, mm-hmm. it almost feels sacrilegious to not go for the next biggest thing mm-hmm. because it's the way that we honor the struggle of our ancestors in some kind of way to yeah. be like, okay, their house got taken away from them. So I'm going to get a big ass house. Right. Them. You know, like we just, you know, it just needs to be really large. Or we're like, no, I worked really, really hard yeah. because we work really, really hard and we try to to get in the rat race in many ways and we're making a higher salary. So why can't we have that thing that we want or yeah. why can't we? And in that way, if you look from that perspective, it's a lot about like denying ourselves things. And I think it's really not about denying, but it's getting super clear just like you were to be like, okay, if I sit down and I think about the things that I want for myself and the future that I want for my family, that looks like a home we own. Mm. That looks like a happy child. That looks like these things. Yeah. So it's about getting aligned actually. And boundaries. And putting our resources so we can mm-hmm. actually achieve those things. Yeah. And Instead of wondering where did all our money go? Or <laughs> like I I had it, but I'm still living paycheck to paycheck. And there's no shame or judgment there because I've been there and I'd be there sometimes right now. <laughs> but we 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 still we still want the best for ourselves and the best for ourselves is really possible. And so you live in twelve hundred square feet. And I can imagine that with three and right now, and for uh, me and E, we live in, I think, 850 square feet, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And that's way too much space for me, actually. (laughs) It's just ginormous. Yeah. And it's about, a lot of times it's like, yeah, we have too much crap. And then also the way that we design our spaces just don't work because we're not paying attention. Yeah. We just are going out and we're buying things, but not asking deeper questions to be like, does this function? Yeah. And will it last too? Will and not last? just buying like, is this couch, right? Right. Is exactly. This right. Exactly. Is this desk right. Do I have the correct chairs? Like, is this table too big for this space? Mm. It might be. Yeah. So when you get super curious, we can make better decisions and we can make our space work and people will be astonished. Astounded. Yeah. Astounded <laughs> when I come over to be like, why does it feel so great in here? Why does it feel so comfortable? Because I have people come to our house and their houses are bigger. We pay far less than they do because yeah. we choose to live out on the, the hinterlands of the Bay Area so we can put more money towards our dreams. Mm-hmm. And they look and they're like, it feels so good in here. And it's not that much space. Like it's not huge. You don't have a huge space, but I love it here. And yeah. I love that because I feel that way in my space. Mm-hmm. And I don't need more. But I love that point about especially getting rid of all your books. Go, girl, I got a book. I, I just bought two magazines yesterday. I just <laughs> like books and magazines are my weakness. Yeah. And we have to get rid of some of our book collection. But I love that you were saying that you donated them to schools because there's tons of places that you can send your things that'll be used right. and not sent to East Africa. Schools are a great one. Prisons are a great one. 
rehabilitated women who are going to work for the first time is where you can send your clothes. There are tons of really great options. I was thinking about this earlier today. Like typically the question that we ask ourselves is, what do I want? And I think women in particular are now just beginning to ask that self that question. Like that's a new learning edge for a lot of women to say, what do I want? But I think for me, an intimate and a really compelling and tender question is, what do I need? Mm. To ask that's that question in a new way, instead of it restrictive in a way, but to say like, what do I need to be stress-free? What do I need to look and feel my best? Mm-hmm. What do I need to have more space mm-hmm. in my life and in my home? Mm. And that that would bring up new new answers that we haven't ever considered before. And that we might actually buy things or borrow things or incorporate things in our life that we hadn't had before because we weren't caring for our needs either. Yeah. Just the wants. Yeah. That yeah. had nothing to do with our well-being. <laughs> that is such, um, oh, that's amazing. That is so powerful what you just said. And a lot of people need to hear that specifically people who are trying to dive into this minimalism. It's a lifestyle. It's not a trend. It's a lifestyle. (laughs) And it takes practice. It takes commitment. And it takes boundaries. And that is something that I'm learning day by day. Like, we're not fully in it, but we're almost fully in it. And as a family of three, it can be really difficult because we all have things right and it's like okay how do we get rid of some of these things and also how do we keep the things that are timeless that can be passed down that we need and then how do we detach from the things that are just taking up space Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm trying to teach Charlie because she has all the things (laughs) and I recently when she was away I recently just cleaned out her stuff donated toys books just stuff and she did her room was so open and airy afterwards and she didn't even notice no. and that's how and that's how you know it's an it's problematic when oh. you're so used to just having things on things on things that you don't even realize when those things are gone and she and i have had these she's nine right so she doesn't really understand she just wants all the things but she and i have been having these conversations the older she gets like you don't need that You don't Mm -hmm. need that. And you don't really want it. You think it's so cute because it's neon and it's fuzzy. But that's not something that you need. You have 50 stuffed animals that you don't play with. (laughs) You know? So I think that I think that it also starts at home, too, with our kids, Mm -hmm. not overbuying them or or not buying them. Mm -hmm. I know that my mom, I felt like my mom at some points was buying me because she worked so hard. Absolutely. She wasn't around as much as she may have wanted to be. And every time that she got the chance, I was spoiled rotten. Yep. And you know, I'm I'm tr- I am trying my hardest to break that with my child because it comes becomes so easy to just, you know, to buy people. And it's so easy, but it's so, there's so much joy associated it with, with it giving. Too, yeah. With giving to give them the best things. Yeah. You love to see their face light up and yeah. you love to give them what they want. Yeah. And I love that you're saying that because I have a lot of people in our Instagram community who are like, this is cool, but it's just you and eat. Like you don't have kids. How, how do you manage or how do you start a minimalist lifestyle? with kids. And I was talking to one mother in particular, and she said that she had two kids. And she said it was really difficult because they were in high school and they wanted all the things, but all the large things. (laughs) Yeah. Um, No longer the things that are just neon and fuzzy, but like TVs and shoes and and all that stuff. And Mm -hmm. when I was thinking about it and imagining myself in that position, because I hope to be a mother in this next decade, I, I thought about my mom. Mm-hmm. And I wrote back to her and I said, I know it can seem really, really difficult. And it's true. It's difficult and hard to manage other people's things. But maybe you don't have to manage other people's things. Mm-hmm. Maybe what you can do is start in the places that it's actually your domain. Like your kids don't cook. Right. <laughs> like you can create a minimal kitchen and you can organize it in a way where it, it makes it enjoyable to be in there. Mm-hmm. And that may seem small for you, but your kids are watching you. Yeah. And you can have power over it when you go to 
your wardrobe and you say, you know what? I'm not going to buy every single season, everything that comes out because actually that doesn't look good on my body. <laughs> right. I get a capsule wardrobe where I look fabulous all the time. Yeah. Where I buy pieces that are deserving of my body. And you know what? Your kids are watching you. Yep. So I really do think that just as I learned, like as I can call back that memory of my mom going to JCPenney and handing over that credit card and saying, don't ever have a credit card. I learned a lesson I didn't know I was learning. Mm -hmm. And so you're teaching lessons that you're also not even aware that you're teaching as well and that they can both be powerful. So we have the choices and the decisions. So for those with kids out there, I would recommend the same kind of thing. Like think about the places in your own space, in your own life where you can have freedom for yourself. And that kind of freedom is freaking inspiring. <laughs> Ro, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap us up here, but I have two questions for you before mm -hmm. we wrap up. The first question is to piggyback on what you mentioned earlier. What do you need? Mm, I love that. What do I need? Right now, I need even less. I mean, really. I mean, what I need is I've got some areas in my space that are just holding us down. We might be moving, who knows? Yeah. And we need to be able to pick up. So for me, I'm thinking, okay, so if, if, if I need freedom of movement in the future to step into my possibilities, maybe we need to downsize just a few more things. Um, but the other thing is I need to enjoy this time and to enjoy this season. So I'm thinking about my outdoor spaces in a new way and thinking about how can I get myself outside a little bit more and reconnected to nature and reconnected to my body. So those are my needs at present. I'm curious, what, what do you need? Can I ask you? Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting when you're asked on the spot, right? Yeah. I would have to piggyback on what you said. I need less and I need more natural light in regards to space. I need a clutter free environment so that I can think and that I and so that I can write. I also need to exercise more and move my body and stretch and be outside and I need more detachment from electronics. So that's something on my list too, detaching and disconnecting and really turning inward. That's something that's really on the rise for me. Uh, Ryan has this joke that after 6 p.m. you have to call the house phone, like our cell phones are going to be off because we, we need that. We need that. Families need to connect in a way that doesn't require their phone in front of them. So that's what I would say I would need. Peace of mind. All of that just circles back to peace of mind and, yeah. you know, freedom to move and enjoy this life because we only have one. My last question for you would be define minimalism in your words and in how it shows up in your life. Minimalism for us. I, I guess I have to use these words, which is minimalism is the ability or practice of traveling light so you can travel far. Mm, I love that. I can't that. think of any other words, better words than that. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. And before we say our goodbyes, please let everybody know where they can find you on the internets and connect with you. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so overwhelming with questions. So you can find E and I and our story and our journey at at Brown Kids at uh, on Instagram, um, all one word. So at Brown Kids, all lowercase. And we're there. You can find us. <laughs> and we'd love to chat with you, uh, everyone's family there. Oh, wonderful. Okay, Ro, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> so good to have you. And I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you so much. I can't wait to. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hey Girl is a member of the District Productive Network, produced by Jamie Benson and me, Alex L. Music provided by DC's own Kokai. Kokai.